So Amanda Tickner and Scott Madry are from UNC Chapel Hill, and a lot of their work is in uh, France. And um, I'm hoping that they have some time to talk about some of the technical difficulties uh, and solutions to using um, historical maps in the GIS. But whatever, well, I think it's going to be interesting. There, there are no technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're using even you just, older maps. You just close your eyes. And well, hi. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Scott Manry. Uh, we'll be doing a one-two punch here. Amanda will uh, be following me, and uh, I'll try to go real fast on uh, my segment so that we can uh, hope to get ourselves back on time. So, yes, uh, we're from uh, UNC in Chapel Hill, and uh, we uh, have a long-term research project in the Burgundy region of France. Uh, you have to work somewhere. So, uh, you know, might as well uh, do that. And so let's see if this will, yeah, so we're going to talk about using historical maps in uh, our case study uh, of our uh, area of Burgundy, France. And Amanda and I are actually presenting, but we have several colleagues who are intimately involved in uh, our work. So essentially, we have a, a research project going on right now called the Burgundy Historical Landscapes Working Group. and. Uh, we have several uh, people with different skill sets who have uh, come together sort of as a research uh, uh, collaboration to do a very long-term study of the uh, human occupation of this one small uh, region of, of southern Burgundy. And uh, really, we've, I've been working there since 1978, and um, a lot of uh, people have been working there for many years with different uh, academic skill sets and we're all just basically trying to understand the relationships between human cultures, the changing human cultures in the research area, and the environment, how the different levels of technology and social organization, political organization, affect the environment, and also, in some ways, are formed by or constrained by the natural environment. So I do uh, archaeology and uh, historical GIS, Amanda also, uh, does uh, this work. Elizabeth Jones is our historical anthropologist. Uh, Seth uh, Murray here is our uh, ethnographic uh, oral historian. And we also have some geologists and other strange people working with us. So anyway, we're in the eastern uh, central portion of France uh, here in the uh, southern Burgundy region. And it's a, a very, very large, lovely uh, uh, place. It's a small river, which is a tributary of the Loire River. And so it's a, a very interesting place uh, to work. It has a very long history of human occupation going all the way back to the uh, uh, Neolithic. But we're most interested in the Iron Age, uh, the transition of the Iron Age into the Gallo-Roman, into the medieval period, and into the, the modern era uh, itself. And so our current research, we started out doing Iron Age and Gallo-Roman archaeology, and now we're uh, turning our attention to the modern uh, historical period. And so uh, uh, the uh, focus of this talk is our work with historical maps. I've always been very interested in sort of historical cartography and the techniques and how you do this stuff and what it means. And so over the years, uh, I've uh, done a very uh, small little private collection of historical maps. And, and as the GIS technologies have uh, improved, We've uh, gone out and uh, sought after other maps and scanned them and have uh, incorporated these into our geographic information system database. And so these are the uh, maps that we currently have uh, in our single GIS database. And we actually have maps that go much uh, farther back, over 100 years older than this. But really, it begins with the 17. 50 Cassini triangulations. They were the very first maps ever in Europe uh, that were made with uh, uh, modern uh, surveying techniques. And all the maps that we have before this really are just kind of cartoons, kind of like the Lossy map. The kind of stuff kind of goes this way, but you can't really tie it down. It's really with the beginning of the uh, Cassini triangulations in the 1750s that we can begin to try to really pin things down. And so here we have. Uh, the specific maps that we have in our study area uh, already entered into our GIS. And the numbers in red here are the years between the different maps. 
And so what we're doing is looking at a period of over 250 years where essentially the longest uh, break between our two maps is the first two of 80 years. And after that, as you can see, we're down to approximately a generation between the different maps. But these are very, very different maps. And uh, as you know, when you the farther back you go with these maps, and as pointed out by our previous speakers, the scales change very widely. And the reason that people made these maps very widely, we have phylloxera maps that, that show the extent of the damage uh, of the phylloxera uh, infestation. We have cadastral maps. We have uh, uh, generic uh, maps. And so where these come from and why they were made is what Amanda's going to uh, talk to you about later. So anyway, here's a, a couple of, of the representations of our stuff. And by the way, we have in the program is a link to our website. If you're interested in any of these things, you can go to our website and contact us if you have questions. So here we are. Whoops. That. So here we are in uh, uh, the Ark Monster. And uh, here you can see some of our uh, various maps. This is our 1759 Cassini map. It's about 1 to 84,000 scale. Uh, uh, actual field work was done in 1757, two years before. And we actually have, I've been to Paris to the uh, Institut Géographique National. We actually have been able to look at the surveyor's records. So we actually had the documents of the surveyors who made this map in 1757, and we're able to see which church steeples they were at and where they shot uh, these from, and it's, uh, it's, it's just all very fascinating. So anyway, here you can see uh, we have lots of data in our GIS, and, it's, and what we've done is pulled out all the cultural and environmental features of each of the maps that we can. So we pulled out all the roads, all the mills, all the ponds, each individual structure, uh, the forests, and stuff like that. So this is our 1759 map. The next map we have is our 1848, uh, the uh, series started by Napoleon I, called the Etat Majeur. And uh, you can see, those of you who are interested in cartography, it uses Hachur instead of uh, uh, ISO lines for topography, and it's great unless you're in an area of steep topography, and then everything just gets uh, gets uh, kind of messy. This is our 1895 uh, cantonal uh, map, and again, you can see many of the individual features. We're particularly interested in uh, tracking the use of water and waterways and mills and ponds. It was a huge uh, deal of uh, uh, grinding the grain, so we've tracked and are publishing some papers on this. Here's our modern uh, era, and in 1945, we had a, a wonderful series of aerial photos that were taken just as the Allies were pushing the Germans out of this uh, portion of France. And so we have a, a very interesting uh, glimpse in the, the, the uh, historical era uh, during and right at the end of the Second World War. And here's our baseline uh, 1983 1 to 25 topographic map. Here's uh, our, uh, that map with our forestry data extracted and uh, we've done a lot of work looking at the forest cover and the change in forest cover over time. And so here you can see all the forest polygons uh, pulled out of this and here we have our uh, one of our, uh, our second most recent uh, data set uh, which is the next iteration of the IG and topo maps. And you can also see uh, here in some areas in orange, you see areas that have added or taken away uh, uh, from uh, forest cover. Uh, we also have two communal property ownership or cadastral map sets, one beginning in 1834 and the other in 1964. And so we manually, these were in an attic in the Marie um, and they wouldn't let us take them out, so we had to buy a Xerox machine and take it up in the attic with no windows in August and manually copy every uh, one of these. So you, you kind of have to want to do this stuff, I guess. And, uh, but here's the result of that. Here we have our 1834 cadastral layer. And uh, again, we've uh, got the historical documents, the property ownership, the tax data, who, who owned this, when it was sold, when it was bought, all that kind of stuff. 
uh, that we are in the process of uh, trying to work with and analyze today. So we have a very rich uh, set of uh, data, and so what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn it over to my uh, colleague, I mean, and she's going to talk to you specifically about some of the fun that we have in terms of trying to deal with all of these data. Hi. Um, so I'm going to rush because we have 10 minutes. <laughs> um, but I just thought I would bring up some of the issues that we've had um, dealing with this, these historic maps and using them for research um, briefly. Um, and uh, so not so much the results. I don't want to be presenting the results of our work, but more just kind of these are the things we've run into as, as things to think about if you're engaging in your own historical map research. Okay. So one of the things that we've, we've uh, dealt with were, was copyright issues. Um, and normally you don't think about that with historic maps because, well, the Burns Convention, uh, which pretty much has been signed on internationally, uh, so you're good if it's below before 1925, roughly things are going to be out of copyright if they're before 1925. But if you're doing the things after that, so like our 1951 maps, you could republish the base maps. And you could say transformative use, so if you trace that as you would when you're extracting things in GIS, you're probably okay because that's transformative use. But ultimately, if you want to publish the base maps, maybe you need to think about getting copyright permission. And Scott, thankfully, made a wonderful contact at the uh, French uh, National Mapping Center and uh, managed to get us basically what would be considered a limited license, which is he wrote us a letter <laughs> saying, yes, go ahead, go forth and publish on these maps. Um, and the reason I put this up there is um, uh, just to emphasize that a lot of map maker makers are very serious about maintaining copyright. And that's an example of Google Maps putting what's called a trap in the map. Um, so Arbelton doesn't exist. Um, and Google Maps put that in there probably to get someone to trace it and then they could say, oh, that, that doesn't exist, so um, you copied our map. And, and this is quite kind of common. Although technically that doesn't hold up in copyright law either because um, there were other instances of phone book companies who were trying to copy each other who would put fake things in and they were uh, legally sort of disbarred from doing that because apparently if you put Fictional information mixed in with non-fiction, that's not copyright, according to some court cases. So it's a way of catching people, but it's not a way of like nailing them. <laughs> anyway, um, copyright is something to think about. Um, it's something if you're providing maps for people, you might want to be clear about what your copyright expectations are. Um, so something to think about as well is how is the map made? We've talked about this, so I'm not going to belabor it too much. But um, thinking about the accuracy of the maps, um, was there good geodetic triangulation used um, or not? In the case of our Cassini map, thinking about, okay, the cartographers were oftentimes scared to go into some of these rural areas because they were being attacked. <laughs> people didn't want to be taxed. That's what map making meant. Um, and so they were looking at things from, say, a small town where they felt safe, church towers. And so you get inaccuracies in these maps based on where people were willing to go to survey. Why was the map? So we've talked about that too, um, so I won't belabor it again, but we've had issues with that in our map series. Um, one of the things that's happened recently is this is our 1983 map, um, uh, and this is the 2003 map, and this map is very accurate. This is our most accurate map. Um, why, when things are getting more and more improved in terms of technology, would our map quality go down? Well, that was because they made this map for tourists. <laughs> Um, and they say so at the top. It's like this is for, for people going on Randade, which is which is uh, basically hiking tours in the rural areas. And so because of the shift in orientation, the map quality decreased because they weren't expecting people to be using it for surveying or for any kind of scientific application. Um, so that can be an issue. And thinking about okay, maybe your older one of your older maps might be more accurate than a more modern map. It's it's not necessarily true that as you progress through time, these maps get better. About accuracy. Um, scale is another issue which we've talked about, and what you can see here. Um, so, this is sort of the break point. At 1951, we have sort of our more modern maps at a very tighter, at a tighter scale. So, these are easily comparable, and these are kind of comparable. The sky is a little bit of an outlier. Trying to figure out how to get these guys and these guys <laughs> comparable 
is R. Um, and in this case, what we're trying to do here is look at shifts in ponds over time. And why we're excited about that is that ponds in this area are man-made. So they're very um, labor-intensive and emblematic of, of uh, shifting agricultural practices and economic practices and all kinds of things. Um, and the reason that they're increasing here, we think, is mainly due to tourist activity. People have been identifying that in our oil history collection, or ethnography, as being a, a real reason why they're increasing pond usage. But trying to figure out what the trend is, you know, over time is hard when you're, when you're dealing with scale. And there are ways, I mean, thinking about this, we could conceivably drop the ponds that are of this, the smaller size that show up here that may be inflating the totals. I mean, there are statistical ways of handling this, but they're, you can think about it. <laughs> um, and this is kind of a messy map, but I, I like it. Uh, so I'm going to show you anyway. Uh, just because it shows some of the, the landscape continuity in the area. So even if you have issues of scale and accuracy that make things very problematic, you can see here the stripies are the older map areas of forest, and the pale blue is 2003 areas of forest. So I'm kind of the most recent map. And uh, it demonstrates that there's a lot of continuity in forests in the area. Um, and those are mostly happening in upland areas. So I didn't. I told you I wasn't going to go over results. Here's some results. Um, but anyway, uh, so even if they're inaccurate on the edges, which they probably are, because the 1759 map is not not great. It's okay, um, but there is still stuff you can get out of it. You can get at the fact that those areas were likely continuously in some kind of forest. They may have been harvested at some points, but they were they were forest. Geo-referencing. Um, so we talked a little bit about this too in some of the other talks, but um, so you can see here how warped some areas get. And to a certain extent, you just have to kind of print and bear that, I think, with historic maps, um, that there is going to be inaccuracy, and your RMS may not be perfect. But maybe that's okay. Because if you get into the scale issue again, um, sometimes your maps of an earlier period are going to be of such a large scale, and you're comparing them to maps that are such a smaller scale that those pixel changes that you're seeing, you know, five meters RMS, does that really matter when you're dealing with a map at 100,000? <laughs> it, it's, it's something to think of, not, because people, I've seen people get very hysterical over RMS, uh, root mean square error, when they're georeferencing and, and sort of dismiss historic maps because they can't get the RMS low enough. Well, um, I still would argue that they're useful, and maybe that our message is telling you what you think it is. Um, okay, and so extra data can help. When you're dealing with historic maps, one of the things that we've done that's been really helpful um, is to go back in time uh, based on our most accurate map, the, the 1983 map, and using that to georeference maps going backwards, basically, and looking at the features going backwards. And what you're seeing here is uh, basically all of this this particular pond, which is around a particularly cool historic place, which I will tell you about if we have time, don't, um, called Lusigné. Um, it's very cool. It's, it's from 1200. But we have lots and lots of historic documents that talk about that pond and talk about um, how that pond was used, and so those have been very helpful to sort of justify the fact that yes, in fact, they were, this pond really was on all the maps. But, and this is kind of a prominent example of that, but there are other ponds where we've also been able to back them up with other documents and sort of test the accuracy of these maps using historic documents and say, okay, yes, that, that pond really was on this map in this place based on this historic one. Um, so that's been very helpful for, for helping to um, verify the maps. Another thing that's been helpful in verifying the maps is actually doing ground truthing. Um, so we're able to go out and look for dams because as I mentioned, all the ponds are man-made. So we can go and find old dams and say, yes, this is the point and take a point using our wonderful Garmin and actually go and look on our maps and see, yes, do we have that pond there? Um, and so we've been able to do that. And in this case, this is this pond near Fress. It's on the 1840 map. It's not on the 1983 map, but we were able to find the remains of it and kind of verify that. Another really cool thing that we were able to do, Scott thought of it, yay Scott, um, was uh, put small geo-referenced historic maps into our garden. Um, 
upload them, and then uh, go uh, walk around on those maps, essentially taking them and walking around. And in that fashion, we were able to find, it was very, very cool, um, a mill foundation that we had not been able to find uh, any other way. <laughs> Um, and we've been looking for that for, for a while. Like we would repeatedly go to the area where we thought it was, look around, and find it. But after we did this, bam, we went right to it. Um, so that's been a really exciting and helpful thing to do as well. So it sort of simultaneously verifies the map and also uses it to find, find locations. Okay, so um, things to consider when you're working with historic maps thinking about the resolution and the accuracy, the scale, um, when you're comparing different scales, the purposes of the maps, and doing ground truthing using this oral history, historical documents on the ground can be really, really helpful in interpreting your data. Here we go. So it's a little after three, like 3.03. If you would like to ask some questions, are you guys available for a few more minutes? Okay, then um, we, if you aren't, if you need to leave, leave. It's the end of the conference. It's been a great conference. Thanks for coming. Any questions? Right. And they weren't accessible, but for some reason, only some of them were. I couldn't see the originals. What were you looking at and where? Um, I uh, was looking at them on microfilm. Um, and you might repeat the question. Okay. Yeah, the question was about uh, access to the, to the land grants um, at the state archives. Um, I was using microfilm, um, which you can purchase copies, and I bought a little tiny, uh, <laughs> very primitive reader off the internet for cheap because I was a grad student. Uh, and so I did this at home and would work on them all night, and it was really fun. Um, but uh, I understand now that a lot of them have been digitized, and that website that I showed you, um, or at least I showed you the link, um, uh, has a lot of the images on there as well as the catalog data um, from the state archives. So that is now an excellent uh, search tool. That's important. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Anybody else? Did you find that military improvements in anticipation of the war, I believe, that had any of Indian wars, there wasn't really much going on because there had been uh, depopulation by both disease and migration. So um, I don't think it was, yeah, I think it was mostly trade. And interestingly, some of the roads that Dale was showing, I recognized as parts of the trading path. So uh, uh, both the main branch and where it splits uh, down south of Concord and one part goes to Waxhaw, one part goes to Charlotte, through Charlotte and on, uh, off the Cherokees. Um, so it all ties together. Anybody yep. else? <laughs> Take that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, Could you sort of recap the question or yeah. the comment? Uh, 
she was talking about you know, uh, some of the finding some of the older landowners in the area and preserving their oral history of uh, them. I have done that in some cases, and not to discount that at all, I think it is a wonderful resource, but uh, everyone believes that they had something really important on their property. <laughs> and that oral history sometimes can be a little uh, skewed sometimes. Um, but uh, I, I agree with you, I think it is important to, to try to document that stuff, but, but take that as an oral history as well. There's, there's some, uh, what was the term you used again? Uh, uncertainty. Uncertainty, yes, thanks. <laughs> some uncertainty to, uh, to that data. That's a great idea. Um, Geocoding or getting uh, GPS locations of, of structures, houses or other types of structures as well. Um, you know, it's one of the things that I have included some structures that I know you know were to the period that I was looking for on, on my roads, um, along with other sorts of features, uh, whether they're man-made or natural. But yeah, any sort of documentation of those things is tremendously helpful especially if you can give it a date. Um, a quick plug for another organization that I, I work with is the uh, Historic Mapping Congress. The Historic Mapping Congress is really active, most active here probably in the Carolinas. Um, there's, the group is really all over the East Coast, but they're trying to bring together people that have, have, that have an interest in historic data and historic maps and preserving as much information from those as we can to try to make it accessible. So our ultimate goal is to try to make any data that people want to go collect and make that available to researchers for future research. Anything else? Got a question there? Back there? Um, for Scott and Amanda, I was just curious, um, does UNC, you guys apply for grants to study that part of Berkeley? We, we gratefully accept all funds, <laughs> any currency. So uh, it's hardly a labor of love. It's mostly a labor of love. Uh, it, to be honest, it's very difficult. Uh, the, one of the reasons we've transferred over to the historical era uh, is it's impossible now to get archaeological excavation permits in France. And so this lets us keep working uh, without having to dig. But uh, it, it's. Uh, it's very difficult to get to get funds uh, to do this kind of work. It's not historical geography. It's not cartography. It's not anthropology. It's not archaeology. It's it's some melange of all these things together. So it's not it's not an easy thing to fund. And uh, I will gladly give out tax receipts. <laughs> we would like to help us. We do have uh, we have been very successful in some way getting some grants. Second question. Uh, so if it's not to Points or areas for how do you decide on the margin of error that's appropriate? Yeah, yeah, and more that. And, and what is the purpose? Right, and so our uh, ultimate, uh, we have two ultimate purposes. One is just the Code of France and Group One. Uh, it's hard to get grants with that justification. Uh, the, the other one is we're doing, in the, the French have this wonderful um, academic uh, uh, con concept of the uh, the annals of school, it's called the Etude du Longue Durée, or Long Duration Studies. And so our ultimate goal is to try to understand this little piece of ground uh, over a 2,000, 2,500 year epoch. So we're going from the Iron Age to the Roman to the Medieval to the Modern Era. And what we're trying to do is use all of the tools available to, to try to understand the relationship between human cultures and their environment. And so when we're doing our uh, 2,000 years old, we don't have maps, although we do have a Pudinger table that looks very much like his post map. Uh, but uh, so we use archaeology or dendrochronology, tree rings for the very old stuff. In the modern area, that's when maps become available, and so we use uh, whatever we have. Uh, available. So our, our long-term reason for working in this area is one that is very rich in uh, both archaeological and the, and the specific reason we chose that commune where I showed the cadastral map 
is that we have uh, early 1700s uh, ownership data for that small commune. So we picked that little commune in Uxo uh, specifically because uh, they they retained the tax records from the 17 before the revolution. And so we actually had something to work with in, in that location. But finding, finding data that you can use, and then to your specific question, what what scale is good enough? And it's this constant sliding scale, literally, of the kind of questions that we're asking, like as she showed, we're trying to place all these ponds, and when did they appear, and when did they disappear? On the scale, on the maps of 180,000, a lot of these little tiny ponds just aren't there. I don't think it meant they weren't there, they just weren't recorded in the maps of those scales. And so one of the fun things about doing this kind of work is you become very knowledgeable about these maps and who made them and why and what purpose they serve. And that helps guide us in terms of the kind of uh, questions that we can or can't ask. And a lot of times we'll just discard a map series for a certain kind of analysis because we have hints that this map really probably wasn't made for that particular purpose. So learning about the cartography and the history of the cartography and how they were made and really the purpose that they served uh, helps guide us through this process of when and for what purpose we can use them. Not a very clear answer, but it's not a, it's not a very clear thing, but it's a, but it's a lot of fun. Else? Oh. I uh, I use historical maps and do genealogy research for uh, my surname, which in North Carolina there were three different branches of my surname: one in Rowan County, one in Granville County, and one down in Bladen County. And I'm not in any of those, but since I live in Raleigh, I get requests to help people track things down for a particular branch of family. And one of the things I've had to do is explain to people that when their, their ancestors owned land in Granville County, it's not the Granville County that they see on the map today. It's Granville County that was in the 1700s. Did you find in, uh, Rebecca, in your research, did you find uh, any difficulty in trying to determine where to look for the land grants, what county, I and mean, some of the counties don't even exist anymore? Uh, do you have much trouble with that? Well, as a matter of fact, one of the first things I did in my whole long, years long process was recreate historical counties in GIS um, for exactly that reason. Um, and then uh, Newberry Library came along behind me and did the whole thing. So, uh, you know, so <laughs> I was just a little bit ahead of the curve there. Um, I did all the Piedmont counties from, from uh, the, the first um, evidence of, of counties being made that extended into the Piedmont uh, up through the present. And I had this online, but since I recently cut off my affiliation with UNC Chapel Hill, I had that web page is gone. Um, but I still have all the stuff. I, and I had produced it as public data that you could download and um, uh, as a poster that you could put in the classroom and things like that. Um, so if you're interested, I'll, I'll be glad to share that with you. Um, uh, but, or you can download it from the Newberry Library. We organized it a little bit differently, so they, mine was actually, if your interest is in the Piedmont counties, mine is actually easier to go in and say, I want counties for this time period. And you know, there you have to do some fancy querying and yeah. Um, but that is a big, it is one of the big issues when you start doing historical geography with GIS, is where, where, where are these counties? Well, thank you all, and thank you all. That was a great session. I appreciate it. And don't leave. Gosh, you guys were great. I think. <laughs>